Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Pullman Police Advisory Committee. We have a lot of people here with us today, but <laughs> can you blame everybody? The smoke has cleared and it is nice outside, so a lot of people are probably enjoying the good weather. Uh, so for now, and unless we have another committee member come in, we're just going to pass on doing the minutes because we haven't met quorum. Uh, and we're just going to get right into uh, business for the meeting today. Uh, we do have a special guest with us today, Detective Scott Kirk. Thank you so much for being here today. He's going to talk to us about special equipment, particularly the taser. Um, Chief, I don't know if you had anything else to say about that part of it. No, I'll, I'll turn it over to Scott, but, um, and I didn't remind, I forgot to remind you, Scott, but we, we do record our meetings and then they're posted later on uh, our YouTube channel. Okay. So just an That's FYI. Right. Won't be the first time. <laughs> well, uh, everyone, my name is Scott Kirk. I'm a detective with Pullman Police. I'm also our, our taser instructor. Just a, a little bit about myself. So I've been with the department for 16 years now, and 11 of those years have been as a taser instructor. We, we got our tasers 11 years ago. Um, one of the things we wanted uh, the, the taser to, to do for our agency is really be a, a kind of a stopgap measure, another use of force tool for our officers. Um, somewhere in between uh, an escort, so actually grabbing someone's hand and, and having them go somewhere, or, or an assaultive measure. And think of assaultive as like a, a baton. So a taser will be somewhere in the, in the middle of that. Um, what I'm gonna do today. Hey Scott, would you actually mind standing closer to the mic? I, sorry, because sure. that, that's how we record the voice. Absolutely. I know it's awkward, because I like walking around too, you, but. <laughs> yeah, if you see me waving, and that's I just, that's normally. Okay, so let's get into it. And what are we gonna talk about today is, uh, one, what is a taser? How does it work? Uh, this is gonna be a very brief presentation. Uh, how are PPD officers trained to use it? Uh, medical concerns and questions. And I've given classes to not only officers, but also to WSU and WSU interns about tasers. And there's always some kind of question. So hopefully today you, you can ask those and, and I can answer them. If not, I will find you the appropriate person to do so. Okay, so the, the Taser X26P, uh, that nomenclature is just what we currently at the Pullman Police Department carry with us. Uh, Taser International is a, is a larger organization. Uh, they, I think they recently changed their name to Axon, but they are still Taser in my mind as well. They consider the Taser X26P a conducted electrical weapon, so a CEW. It's almost like the military where they like their acronyms. And here's another one. So a CEW, if you hear me saying that today, that, that's what I'm referring to. So the CEW technology here, uh, any electrical engineers in the room? That's okay, We're, I'm not gonna give you a, an electrical engineering class here. It's very, very brief and, and rudimentary here. So electricity essentially is the flow of electrons through a conductor. Now what is a conductor? A uh, conductor be, could be copper wire, like you can find in your house. Um, it could be the human body, for that, you know, for an example. The human body is consisted primarily of water. Water is a pretty good conductor of electricity. The, there's two, uh, two words here, the voltage and current, that I want to kind of stress on with you today. Uh, voltage is simply the pressure of electricity, and it's the pressure meaning to, in order to bridge a gap or can make a connection, there has to be X amount of voltage in order to do so. And then current, the amps or amperes. Uh, and that's, that's the important one as we, we go along here. Electrical, so the peak arcing voltage. When we talk about the taser, and you, you might have seen this in the news somewhere along the way, uh, the taser itself has 50,000 volts. That seems like a really big number. I mean, it seems like a big number to me as well, 50,000 volts. What does that actually mean? Uh, well, 50,000 volts is actually to bridge a gap of electrical current through the air. So on the end of a taser, which I'll demonstrate at the end here, uh, there are two electrodes, one on the top and one on the bottom of the taser. And in between that is air. And the current has to connect to both of those electrodes in order to cause it to make a current or to be effective at all. And so it takes those 50,000 volts. Now the peak voltage across the body so once it actually impacts a human, drops it down to at most 1,200 volts. It's a lot lesser number. Uh, the low average current, so the current is the amps. It's less than 0 0.004 amps or 0 0.4 milliamps um, is really low. Energy, and I put these, uh, this slide up here just to kind of give you a correlation between a taser itself and say, 
you know, your external defibrillators like you might see in the mall or in your home. Energy stored at a taser, it's on that 3.6 joules and deliver per pulse 0 0.07 joules. Trust me, there's not a test at the end of this. My officers can take the test later, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But an external defibrillator delivers anywhere between 150 to 400 joules per pulse. So you can see the significant decrease there in just what a taser has. Another example here, so your common wall outlet that you see around uh, at your home. You know, wall outlet has 110 volts, it's not a lot, uh, but has 16 amps. Uh, that can do some damage. I don't know if you've ever stuck your finger in a wall outlet, it hurts like the dickens and it could cause some pretty bad uh, burns and so forth. The taser down at the right there, the 0 0.0036 amps or 0 0.3 six or 0.3 milliamps the amperage is really low and amperage is what harms the human so the voltage that big number that's just to bridge a gap that's the pressure the amperage that's what actually can cause damage and if you've you've been to the seattle uh, history museum they have a van de Graaff generator there well that thing's pumping out a million volts and I don't know about you, but other than a bad hair day, uh, <laughs> this lady and her child seem to be all right. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's quite a lot of volts. So what I'm going to demonstrate here, I said the 50,000 volts was to bridge a gap of two inches or, or through air. This video here, if I can get it to play, is going to demonstrate that arc that I was telling you about. Perhaps. That's okay. I knew this might happen, so I actually brought with me a taser. The taser itself does not have a cartridge on the end. That's why I'm putting my hand over here. But on the, on the end of it, I'm not going to bring it too close to you right now, but on the end of it, there are two metal, metal uh, electrodes. And so it's about two inches of a gap through the air. And you're going to see an arc on the end of the taser in order to bridge that gap. And that's all it's doing. That's that 50,000 volts right there at the end. So how does that actually work on the human body? Well, the human body, we all have a nervous system. We have a brain and a spinal cord. That's our central nervous system. What the taser can do is actually affect the sensory nervous system, which is what you can feel pain. And if you were to pinch your skin and it hurts, that's that sensory part. And the motor nervous system. The motor system is what's telling you to actually move. You want to throw a baseball, your brain has to tell the body, here's the motion I want to do that in. What the taser can do is interrupt both the sensory and the motor nervous systems together. And so it really doesn't matter how you know, strong someone is, um, you know, how, how well they don't feel pain. If you've heard the myth that, oh, I don't feel pain, I can, I can walk through a taser. Well, if it's deployed correctly, that's not possible. It'd be an example, if Corey called Amy on the telephone, and you two were talking, so you're the, the nerves talking to one another, and I intercept that phone call, and I pick it up, and I start screaming into the phone. Can Corey and Amy hear one another? <laughs> not, not so much, and so it's affecting the nerves there. And we call this, this, here's another acronym, this NMI up here, it's called Neuromuscular Incapacitation. I love acronyms. Trust me, my officers are tested on N NMI. The cartridge uh, is composed of, of pretty much everything that you see flying out the end of the taser. Uh, so we have the probes, uh, a primer there, it's a little electrostatic primer. So when that arc goes across the cartridge, it, it can actually deploy uh, the, the, the two probes. There's a big nitrogen cap capsule that's inside. That's what pushes the probes out of the cartridge. The AFITS, another acronym, and you can see a common theme here, is an anti-felon identifier. They're just little pieces of confetti, and you'll see them today. They, there's about 33 of them, and they just kind of go everywhere. And then there's a puncture pin. So down at the bottom here, uh, that puncture pin just releases, it breaks the plastic so the nitrogen can go through and actually propel the darts going outward. The, here's our probes, and that one in the middle is the one that the Pullman Police Department has. So that, that that needle sticking out the end there, it's a little less than a half an inch. The entire thing, you know, all combined is only an inch and a half. And then the copper wire just 
gets tied through the little hole at the bottom of the probe. And so the wire in the probe is what's going out and impacting someone. And then the little pieces of confetti, the aphids, are what goes everywhere. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I tell my officers and how they use the taser. So we, I try to focus on not only here's you know, where you would aim and those kinds of things, but also some considerations of maybe when not to use the taser. That's just as important to me. We have a policy. So each member of the department who carries a taser must be, re must be trained to do so. Uh, every member of the department carrying a taser has to have at least four hours worth of training per year. Um, our instructors, uh, there's me and another officer who are, are two instructors for the agency, and we go through eight hours of training um, every year. The very first time we became an instructor, it was 16 hours. So a little bit of training involved there. So we still, we want to use the minimum force necessary to accomplish the lawful objective. Um, we use this, the, the taser itself, on actively resisting. And this is one of the things that I think the, the Poland Police Department has done well with uh, when articulating in our policy when an officer can use it. It used to be, when I very first started with the taser, so 11 years ago, um, if I could grab your hand and make you walk somewhere, I could use the taser. That's no longer the case. Now that person actively has to be resisting, meaning that officer probably would be justified in using even more force, but that's when the taser comes into play there. And when reasonable, give a verbal warning before the use of a taser, or before the use of force. On the taser itself, because I talked to you about it doesn't really matter you know, if the person is strong or they, they're under the influence of alcohol or drugs or maybe they can't feel pain, I'm not as worried about using or giving a verbal warning because there's not much they can do to defeat the taser. If they put their hands out and for some reason a probe landed in, in both hands, well now the electricity is going through, you know, from hand to hand. Uh, we have OC spray uh, that if someone covers their eyes, the OC spray doesn't really work all that well. The taser's not relying upon that. Uh, give the subjects a reasonable opportunity to comply before force is used. Uh, this is almost all, always the case, whether it's a taser or not. Um, we've given instructions to people that didn't hear us. And even if someone's yelling, well, in the thick of things, maybe they didn't hear, so I train the officers to, to you know, wait for them to comply. If you're telling them to go from their back to their stomach or vice versa, give them the opportunity to do so. Immediately cease any force once a subject has surrendered or is captured, handcuffed, and controlled. So each time I pull the trigger on the taser, it goes for five seconds. That's if the officer pulls the trigger and lets go. It's just, it's five seconds. After those five seconds are done, if they reapply the taser or they keep holding the trigger down so it keeps going, that's a separate use of force. So they need to be justified in order to, to actually use that. Targeting guidelines, what I'm talking about on the targeting guidelines is where do I want those probes going? So when feasible, use the five second, that window of opportunity to restrain and cuff under power. That person is going to go through some physical effects. I mean, if, has anyone here seen a taser used or seen a video, maybe on YouTube, of it used? That person is doing something uh, during those five seconds. We use that as a window of opportunity to gain compliance over that person or to put them in handcuffs. Uh, I, I'm not tooting my own horn here, but I, I was the, the first officer in Pullman to use a taser in the field. And I was able to actually uh, deploy the taser uh, through the crack of a door, was able to go into the apartment uh, where the person was still going through that five seconds, and able to put them in handcuffs, and, it, and the situation was resolved. It was done. So five seconds is a, is a lot longer than what you think it might be. Avoid multiple repeated, prolonged, extended, continuous taser exposures unless necessary. So like I said, and I harp on this with my officers, that's why I'm kind of harping on it here. Each time you deploy that taser, that's a separate use of force. It's not hold the trigger down until the battery dies. That's not what the officers are trained to do. So medical safety. This is, this is and I can tell you in my experiences, this is kind of the hot button issue. This is what people want to know about. Uh, so this is, and it's very brief. 
today. So cardiac. So what does electricity do to the heart? You know, if you were to stick your hand in a wall outlet, or you know, maybe you're at home working on your sub panel and you hit a 220, chances are your heart might stop. And if that's the case, then then you die. That's not the way the taser taser works. But we want to avoid uh, having that issue, and we call it a dart to heart distances. So another another acronym, DTH. What they're talking about there is the two probes, how close they are to the human heart. This area up here, the upper chest and the face, this is not the first area that we are aiming a taser because the taser electricity affects large muscle mass groups. So in the forehead, I don't have a lot of muscle in, in my forehead, but I've got a lot more in my thighs or maybe my arm or my abdomen. And so this is where we're gonna avoid the heart because our intended areas are not by the heart in, in the, to begin with. And then the duration of delivered electrical charge. I put on here our, our policy, um, which I'll, I'll get to in a second here, but 15 seconds or more, which would be three trigger pulls, the person goes to the hospital, and that's by Pullman policy. Uh, Taser's telling you that the, the further that dart is away from the heart, the fewer cycles apply, the lower the risk uh, is of the Taser affecting the heart. So what's it like to be tased? Okay, I've been tased. I've been tased more than once. Um, I'm glutton for punishment, maybe. Um, I can tell you that what that sensation is that you're feeling is every, every muscle that was affected immediately tightens. And some of the effects, the, the longer term lasting effects, so injuries that we might see in someone, are gonna be your, you know, similar to fighting or fleeing. If you were sitting in this chair and immediately had to get up from here and sprint around the building real quick. Do you think your heart might be racing a little bit? You think you might get some sweat and you know some adrenaline might be pumping, some endorphins might be releasing? That's what you're seeing in people who have been tased. It's because you, you go from you know this level of activity to immediately having every you know all those muscles tense like that. And, that, and that's what we're seeing. So the extended durations, and we, we talked about this with the Pullman policy, we, we have the same uh, established guidelines from some of these other law enforcement agencies, including the Department of Justice. So energized more than three times or has been subjected to continuous energy cycle of 15 seconds or more or exhibited signs of extreme uncontrolled agitation uh, should be transported to a medical facility for, exam uh, for examination. That's not the officer there delivering first aid, that's actually getting that person to a hospital, getting an ambulance involved, okay? Removal policy. So Pullman Police Department, we do have a policy regarding those little darts, you know, that little half-inch barb that I was showing you. Um, if, as long as they are not impacted the sensitive area of the body, you know, if it's in an eye uh, or other sensitive areas, the officers are not allowed to remove those. Okay, that's where an ambulance comes in, um, most likely a hospital. If they are not, uh, so if they are just in an arm or you know, in the stomach or leg or something, the officers do have training on how to properly remove those probes. And actually, we're keeping probes as evidence. So that's, that's part of it. Um, penetration of bone. Uh, I, here's, I'll, I'll tell you the same thing I tell the officers. How do you know when a dart has penetrated the bone? It's, it's very rare. Um, usually get it if someone impacts something hard and it drives that that needle further into their body, it won't move. If you ever play a dartboard and throw the dart at the dartboard and the dart just falls to the ground, that's what it's normally like. It's just kind of dangling in the skin. But if it's stuck and it won't move, it, it's likely in the bone. Consumer tasers, uh, they do have them. And here are, are some of the new ones that they have come out with. Uh, that almost the exact same thing that the police department has, you can go out and you can buy it for I think it's $1,200. Uh, and then the little, the bolt there. The difference and the main difference between the civilian version and the law enforcement version is the civilian version, when you pull that trigger, it goes for 15 seconds. Okay, 15 seconds, that's a long time. And, and take it from someone who's been tased. I don't want to get tased for 15 <laughs> seconds. The whole idea is that you pull the trigger, that person goes to the ground or is incapacitated for 15 seconds. That gives you enough time to run away call the police, and Taser has come out and said, if you file a police report, 
after you've deployed your taser, we'll give you a free take. We'll give you a new replacement. So, okay, I went through all this very quick. Uh, so please, any any questions that I might be able to answer? Yes, ma'am. How often are tasers used by the Pullman Police Department? Well, I've seen over the 11 years the the usage have actually gone down. Um, the exact numbers, I, I don't. Approximate. Like, is it very common to need to use them, or is it more of a, a rare event? It's it's more rare, especially lately. And when I say lately, I say within the last year. When we first had them, uh, it was a new piece of equipment, and the use of force was was lower, and so officers were deploying them more. Um, we're not seeing that now. So is there a way to keep track of the amount of times the trigger has been pulled? Or how do you guys tell that when an officer is finished with the situation? Excellent question. So the, the X, and I, and I kind of glossed over the internal components of, a, of the taser, but these X26Ps, have, they're basically a computer that the officer's walking around with. Every time that I pull, put the safety to fire, it records that that the taser itself does. Every time I pull the trigger, the demonstration I did for you today was recorded on that taser. And it'll keep recording until the officer downloads that information. And so, and we can store that as well. So it, in addition to it, the, the new tasers that we have, the X26Ps, um, the internal components are able to actually tell the, how much energy was delivered to a person. And you can see a significant drop when there's actually a real connection versus, you know, on the clothing. When it's on the clothing, or we call it a clothing disconnect, when that, that probe kind of latches onto the clothes, not into the skin, it takes more voltage to actually go into the person's skin. The taser's recording that. And they call them a pulse log. Related to that, how much does clothing affect? influence the effectiveness of the taser? Yeah, th those little probes they actually do pretty well. So our cartridges uh, right now, they fire 21 feet. And that's from the end of the cartridge door to the very tip of the probe, it's 21 feet. Um, that's a little nitrogen canister. Uh, I can, I don't want to pass it around just because of safety uh, touch it. concerns, but this is the cartridge. It's a little guy. And, and the, the nitrogen canister, obviously, is, is right in the heart of it, and it's pretty small. Um, the, the darts aren't coming out with a lot of force. They're about 300 feet per second. And someone described this a while ago to me. So they're, they're coming out slow enough you can see them, but fast enough you can't get out of the way from them. Um, just not, all, not a lot of force. We train officers that in the wintertime especially, so you've got big hefty clothes and that kind of thing, it's likely the darts may not penetrate those areas. So there's other areas of the body that it will fit you know, tighter to you. Like, your back, for example, is a preferred target area because where do clothing fit tighter on you? Regardless of size, it's going to be on your back. But a taser will work if it's on the bottom of the foot, <laughs> you know, anywhere on the body. So. so once you deploy that one, you can't use that one again, correct? Or because since it's nitrogen based? Right, it you, you won't fire again. Right. But if the probes are in someone, all you have to do is pull the trigger okay. and it'll go off again. Yeah. You just, it's not going to be propelling anything else. It's a one-time, one-shot deal okay. with those two probes. You mentioned that you guys train in situations where officers may choose not to use the taser. Uh, are there certain groups of people, or maybe can you not use it on someone in a wheelchair? Are there certain restrictions on when you can and cannot like use the taser? Sure. The, those are we consider them elevated risk, and okay. so and we and we encompass. It's not just uh, you know elderly or infirm or children. Uh, it's also where they might be standing as well, uh, or where they might be. If they're on the top of a roof on the ledge, and you tase them and they fall off the roof, that's not their fault. That's ours. Um, if they're if they are infirm or frail, and we're talking you know very low muscle mass, uh, we do have a policy to keep that as a consideration as well especially youth, okay? It's, it's just part of the elevated population. Another question I have. I always have so many questions. Oh, sure. Uh, so are officers required to carry a taser? They are not. Okay. No. 
And how many of our officers do carry tasers? I don't know if that's... I'd say the majority of them do. Okay. Uh, they're just not required by policy to do so. I can only think of one uh, officer right off the top of my head that probably does not carry a taser. A question from the audience here? Yes. Yeah, if someone goes to the hospital because they've been tasered, insurance covers them. <laughs> That's a great question. One probably for an insurance carrier or the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> That'd be an interesting thing to see on an insurance bill. <laughs> <laughs> Insurance doesn't want to cover like the normal stuff. I can't yeah. imagine it wants to cover me being right. tased. You mean tasing not in your insurance? <laughs> Underwriter for that? Or? We could buy special insurance. For you that <laughs> They'd probably ask you what yeah, kind of crime you were going to commit. <laughs> Scott, you want to talk about distance? Uh, the distance? Distance of the, the wires and also the how it impacts the spread of the darts. Okay, so uh, distance and spread. Um, these these cartridges uh, that we have, they're, they're 21 feet, and I'm going to tip it just so I don't point the cartridge at you. They're silver colored doors, so that's silver uh, to taser means 21 feet. Um, each probe is in that cartridge at 8 degrees. So it doesn't matter if it's, you know, top or bottom, those probes are at 8 degrees. And what that 8 degrees gives you is for every seven feet of travel for those barbs, uh, that's one foot of spread. And we train, each officer actually has to fire two cartridges a year just so you, they get into their head, okay, where that spread is, where they want to be standing when that happens. Because I can tell you out of experience, most officers want to be closer to people. They want to talk, but, you know, we don't have a conversation you know, from seven feet away. But if they're deploying a taser and they want it to be more effective, meaning contact more muscle mass on the body, they need a greater spread. And so usually 7 to 13 feet, that's, that's our optimal range there. So they have at least a foot of spread. But that, that 21 feet, uh, I've had some officers ask this over, over the years, what if they fall back? Will the wire stretch? It's not their design. They're copper, and you, you'll you'll see. Matter of fact, if you want to see, this is all that wire is. And once it reaches that that 21 feet, if the person falls or uh, you know, the wire breaks, which it does really easy, that's it. Are there certain people that don't react to the taser, even if it does get deployed correctly, and? I, I've never seen a taser deployed correctly that someone wasn't affected by it because, again, we're working on the two parts of the, the nervous system, the sensory and motor. What I have seen is maybe poor deliveries, which is uh, ineffective. So the stomach, okay, and, and, and this year I have a little bit more stomach than I did last year, but I have more fat than maybe muscle. Well, fat's not going to uh, seize like a muscle will. Fat's not going to put me on the ground, but a locked muscle will. I've never heard of a fat cramp, but <laughs> there, there might be one. Um, so th when they're delivered to more fatty areas, or uh, and I see it more on the stomach, um, they are less effective. But I mean, how, how many electricians are out there saying electricity doesn't affect me? I've been an electrician. I mean, it either works or it doesn't. And if it's deployed properly, it's going to work. Uh, drive stun. Drive stun. Okay, there are. So you had brought up well, what happens if, if it misses, or you know, if I've already shot once, but now I don't have a cartridge anymore, so I can't shoot someone else with probes. What can I do? Well, you don't actually need the cartridge for this to work on a body. It's called a drive stun, like driving a car. Uh, when I deploy this, if I push it into someone's body. It's actually getting, they're getting affected by the electrodes here on the end. Um, the, what drive st or what the drive stone won't do is affect both sensory and motor nervous systems. It'll only affect sensory. And so it'll hurt, but it's not going to lock someone up. It's not going to put them on the ground. And that, I have seen. Matter of fact, we have officers who just, they're pretty good at handling pain, and they've been drive stone, and it's not effective because they can fight through the pain. 
Now, I don't like pain, and I've been drive stunned, and it hurts, and I don't want to be near it. So it's like <laughs> a little kid putting their hand in a flyer. You, you, you pull away, and that's what people do. So how many of those cartridges do you carry on you? Just one? And then you would have to use a drive stun? I would carry one, and most officers do, but I recommend two. Um, if you've ever been running behind someone um, and had a taser deployed, you still have to keep track of two objects flying through the air. And so having a backup, having something else I can deploy, that's, that's recommended. But we're running out of physical space on the body. You know, so many tools, uh, I don't have room to put it all. This might be more of a Chief Jenkins question, but if uh, tasers are recognized as a fairly good, like moderate force um, option, why is it not policy for officers to carry them? You know, and I wasn't here when that was uh, decided, so I don't, do you know what the discussion was about around that, Scott? Well, uh, it, it came about about the same time that we actually got a policy to carry OC. So every officer is required by policy to carry OC. Um, but that stemmed from events that took place in, in the city. Uh, when, when the use of force option of taser came up, uh, they decided they weren't going to do that. Um, it's just like a baton, though. A baton is not required to, to be carried by officers. It's just a use of force tool that's available that not everyone chooses to carry. And what I've seen in my career is that if we give someone a tool and they're just not inclined to use it, it whether well. we give it to them or not, they're right. not going to use it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you want to describe your target that you brought? <laughs> sure, yeah. So this little guy, I should say four little guy. Does he have a name? Uh, uh, Ed. I'm calling him Ed. Okay. Um, this actually, this, this target out here is our less lethal target. And, and so it's showing point, you know, areas on the body here that officers would deploy less lethal uh, munitions or things. And you can see that there's a common theme. You know, the central areas of our body and our head, that's red. That's going to be our elevated use of force. The green areas are going to be our primary use of force. Well, we kind of adopted Ed here to use with the taser. And he's been... He's been tased a lot. Uh, <laughs> these darts come out enough where we could, you know, it'll go into drywall, so we try not to damage our facility. And so we've got some insulation foam that actually does the trick pretty well, and it won't won't go through the foam, which tells you how how far or how hard those darts are, are hitting. But uh, for the visual effect, we threw up some aluminum on the back, and so you can actually see. Um, it's easier when it's dark, but when, when Ed's impacted by uh, the two probes, you can actually see the arcing over the surface there because the electricity is being conducted. We're completing a circuit there. Before you shoot two probes in, it's a done deal, and everyone goes home not seeing anything. <laughs> so, yeah, this is our, our demonstration tar target. Are we ready for a demonstration? Yes. yes. <laughs> We've all been waiting for that. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually uh, ask the group here, how, how far do you think 7 to 13 feet is away from a target? Am I in, in about a close enough area? Or? 13, 14 feet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, for me to the wall. I, and, and I do this with the officers, too, because, again, they need to kind of understand, well, how far am I supposed to stand away from someone? Uh, well, we have Ed here, and we have the taser. I put a cartridge on the taser, so I'm not going to point it at you guys. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. You can see the, there, there's a red laser, and the, the tasers themselves are equipped with a laser, a flashlight, or you can turn them off, too, so it doesn't have to be on. We like the laser. It seems to be effective. But there's even a taser out there that has two lasers, one for the top probe and one for the bottom. Uh, that's a whole different animal. With the angle factored in? The angle would factor in. Oh. And so this is supposed to be the top probe, if you can see my my laser floating around here. And is that target in a good enough area people can see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's supposed to be where the top probe, from about this distance, it's going to be pretty darn close, but it's not a bullet. It's not traveling as fast as a bullet, so there's going to be a little bit of a drop. So I'm going to turn the taser on, and let's get that demonstration. So taser, taser, taser. All right.
Right. What I'm trying to do as the person deploying the taser is I'm trying to split this belt line. This in the front of a human, you know, we divide them up into three. So above the belt and then the two legs. We've, we've studies have shown and, and training and everything, we've learned if I can if I can split this belt line, I'm affecting enough muscle groups where this should be a, a, an effective hit and, and establish neuromuscular incapacitation, even on the front. So I've got one probe right up where about the abdomen would be, and another one right in the thigh. And I angled it just a little bit because this bottom probe is coming straight down. A lot of times we'll have officers miss because they're, they're pointing the taser straight up and down. And it's going right through you know, someone's, someone's legs. And it's not going to do much for them. Uh, here you can see, now I'll pass around the cartridge. <laughs> so rarely do you get an opportunity to have someone standing there waiting for you. <laughs> so actually, uh, it's a lot harder than it looks to get both probes to connect. So Scott, when you were tased, did you try defensive tactics, like running, or were you, like, did you go to the bathroom ahead of time? And... I, I did go to the bathroom. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's a smart thing to do. I, uh, I got shot in the back, and I can tell you from, from personal experience that it hurts a lot. Um, some people say, well, have you ever gotten a tattoo, and you know, the tattoos hurt? Well, it's hurt a lot more than a tattoo. I don't think it's quite the same. It's not quite the same. I'm trying to pull one of those probes out. It's kind of embedded there, but I want to... And you were doing it for training, correct? I was doing it for training. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, when did that happen? Nothing is back this. It wasn't for fun or anything. But Taser, uh, years ago, used to require uh, instructors to get takes. As a matter of fact, if I were ever sent to the master instructor school, uh, they, they have you go for 15 seconds. Wow. I'm not wow. sticking my hand up for that one. <laughs> oh, see, I thought you'd just volunteer right for it. <laughs> so how far do those actually go into the body? Um, about up to, let me go back to that, that slide here. Just past the, the barb, and if there's any fishermen in the, in the room, uh, it's actually called the eagle claw barb, this, this little guy right here. This is usually about as far as it goes. That, that barb just barely penetrates the skin. I have seen, and this has been in the back of a police vehicle where the, the officer had left the barbs into the person's back. And when that person sat in the police vehicle, no. you know, it, it, yeah, but it'll go down right until about where that, that lip is. Um, surprisingly, there's more fat on your back, at least my back. <laughs> but. Yeah, we, we try to get those out. The, the quicker the officers can, can pull them out, the less pain it is of actually pulling straight up. You can tell, though, on those little barbs on the skin, it kind of pulls the skin with it. And so it's, it's got to be quick. It's not a, you know, twist. I just feel twist. so badly for the fish now. <laughs> what, I, what I ask my officers to do, and this is what actually they have to put in their report, too, um, is that they visually inspect those barbs. So when they pull them out of someone, they look at them. They make sure, one, the tip is not missing, because if it's missing, it's probably in someone. Um, there's usually going to be uh, cloth and somewhat skin uh, on those. Um, I have been drive stunned as well, and I'll tell you that the drive stun leaves a mark more than the probes do. The probes heal pretty quick. It's a small hole. Um, if I could pull it out of here, unless someone, does anyone have a Leatherman? Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're in there, but it, it's a very small needle mark. Those do heal, you know, with just typical hygiene. Um, the interns, every year I uh, go up to the WSU interns and then they volunteer. <laughs> and I don't argue with them. <laughs> um, but we do some different uh, uh, training tools there. So which parts of the, the body gets affected more or less, um, some get uh, hit with probes, some do not. We have little alligator clips that I can use. Um, and people say that the, the probes, uh, that's the way to go. Because the other ones leave marks more. Because it's burning. That, that drive stun is, is burning the, the surface of the skin more.
What exactly does a confetti do? Like, if you hit them, you're, you're going to know, so. Well, I, I can, the confetti was, came, came out from Taser, um, I'm trying not to crinkle it up here. They're, like I said, they're, they're real tiny. Uh, each piece of this confetti oh, it's pink. has the serial number of the cartridge oh, cool. imprinted on it. And, and the whole idea was that if I were to, you know, use this to, to rob a convenience store or something like that, I wouldn't have time to, to sit there and pick up all the pieces of confetti. <laughs> uh, and so we could trace that back to, to whoever purchased the cartridge. The officers are required to at least find one or two. You know, we don't give them a number. Just find something. Um, but they're kind of everywhere. I mean, the, there's only about 30 of them. Um, we, we've been told by Taser that they guarantee the serial number is on each one. You kind of need a magnifying glass to even see it. Uh, but yeah, now they're everywhere. They'll probably be in this courtroom for a long time. Uh, any other questions? I mean, I appreciate the time. There's always, you know, something. It, I mean, it, I would be scared if I were running away, <laughs> thinking, was that a gun or was that the taser? I didn't realize how loud it would be. I always assumed they'd be more quiet, you know? You, you hear, and you might hear this if you watch YouTube videos, um, officers yelling, taser, 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 when they deploy it, yep. mm -hmm. for that very reason. Mm -hmm. we, we, that audible pop there does, I mean, it can sound like a firearm, mm -hmm. but we want to give our officers warning that we just deployed a taser, not an actual handgun. Okay. Well, well thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Really appreciate Thanks. that. Yeah. That was amazing. Really glad we weren't asked to demo. Now, if that doesn't make you want to follow the law, we'll do that. Okay. So next week, the people that weren't here tonight, you can tell them that we volunteered them to. <laughs> I'll be happy to come back. <laughs> I wonder how many of the officers choose to. I know my sister is an officer as well. She chose not to to get the tase, taser done to her, although she got maced. But like, how many of our officers choose like chose it? And is it like a you know like a pass? Like you chose to get tased? You you officially get the award or pass? Like oh, I, I... <laughs> sorry, so, there, there is. There are some that just flat out say, nope, don't care. You know, I'm not following up to peer pressure. Oh, okay. So there is peer pressure. <laughs> there may be. <laughs> there may be. <laughs> it's like OCs. Oh, I would want to know, and this is what I tell people, is I would want to know what it does to me. That doesn't mean I want to get shot with a firearm. Okay. <laughs> but, you use your imagination for that one. <laughs> but, but yeah, if I volunteer and I can say now that I am affected by it. And so for me personally, I can tell you, on, I guess a more serious note, that if someone was pointing a taser at me, I would consider that a higher level of force because I know what it does to me. Right. And this is what I tell the officers. Well, Chief Jenkins, did you did you pass the test? Or did you... <laughs> I've been tased, actually, okay. yes. <laughs> I haven't seen the video. <laughs> it would have been from another agency. So. Oh, really? Okay. Sounds like a fishy yeah, story. I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> five, that's when he talks about five seconds being long. It's like the longest five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, would you like to volunteer for that? Okay. Or? okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, Lentil Festival review. The Lentil Festival, I think, went really well. Um, we didn't end up uh, doing the child. Uh, doing the fingerprinting for the child kits. We ended up just giving the kits away and talking to the parents and, and how to use them. And I think we gave away more than we did. I don't know if we got numbers on how many we gave away or not, but I can go back and count through those boxes sometime <laughs> and look. But we did get to talk to a lot of people and let them know what the committee was. It was a good time. And thank you, Steve, for being our volunteer, <laughs> citizen volunteer to help run the booth that, that evening. So. Thank you, Hi, thank you. And Eric, thank you also for coming out. Uh, did you have any comments on how it went? I guess I thought it went well, um, other than not having Justin the candy giver. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to definitely have to contact Justin and 
and figure <laughs> out what he did differently last year with the candy. So, so yeah. Well, he just he's willing to be out there just. I say accosting people. That's why I don't do it. But, yeah. You know, just like, um, you know, walking. If you're walking by, he'll be here. Yeah. You know, want one of these? Yeah. Want to know what we're about? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but it went well. Um, had chilling. some good it's conversation. Good. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, it did go pretty well. So. What's the thought about? Because this year, besides just doing it Friday night, you know, we had people there Saturday as well. Um, and Amy, yeah, right? I was there you, for you were there on three Saturday. hours on Saturday. So yeah. thank, you, thank you so much for being there. And how did that go? Uh, it went really well. I think the handing them out and not doing it there was totally fine. I mean, I think the kids are pretty self-explanatory. Um, and having the officers there was useful, and I think it draws more people in initially um and so you can have sort of those you don't need to have justin accosting people because they come to you naturally <laughs> yeah um so yeah i think it went i think it went really well okay was it as windy uh yeah it was super windy um we kept having to try and prevent the board from falling over and uh weren't super successful there <laughs> so that's something we can think about for next year and that was a problem last year too i think that there's just something about the lentil festival needing <laughs> wind well, at least it didn't rain <laughs> every time i call the secretaries at the police department and i say please send somebody to bring us some stuff to weigh things down and yeah there was a bunch of rocks in the i was really confused when i because i got there to set up and i was like why are there all these rocks here yes. like thanks guys well i called into the department and i was like will you please send somebody down to bring some rocks or something and I think at first they were a little confused what I was talking about, but I can't imagine why. Who are you? What are you talking about? Rocks for? Oh. They also some that's a, down some uh, uh, weights. Yeah. yeah. Well, like lifting weights, next right? year we can consider. Our board is really light, so I don't think it's necessarily meant to be used as like an outdoor. I don't know, but everybody else around us was having trouble with that too. Yeah. The, everything was blowing everywhere and. I mean, you, Maybe consider you, some budgie cords next year. you can yeah. try and attach something like that to the canopy, for example. Yes. Um, then it hangs and swings instead of falling over. So. Yes. Yeah, we could but, do that. Like, it seems like a weapon. <laughs> Just like dangling there and whacking people. Yeah. That's what I'm It's imagining. in the back, though, so there shouldn't be people walking by. But, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I also got to ride the UTV yeah. down. That was actually an attraction. Yes, although I I felt compelled not to let the kids play on it, <laughs> and it was it's very tempting, so I just kind of let you know as long as they were being respectful, just sit on that and take a picture. I I mean we kind of just let that happen. I didn't know what you know cause last yeah, year we had. I think car. it's pretty rugged, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was like, well, well, as long as there's no keys in there, so. <laughs> yeah, and I had known Jake had just cleaned this thing. I don't want him to come down here and say, Corey. Why are there popsicles on the scene? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah. But it was it was nice to have down there. I think it yeah. was uh, people. A lot of people came up and asked us, oh, "Are you guys going to be using that now?" And, and like, well, I'm not sure. It's possible they may use it for some things, but I'm not really sure uh, to what extent they're going to be using it. So, um, yeah. Overall, it went really well. Any other comments on the Lento Festival besides how amazing the chili was? People really seem to enjoy the drones and the parade because we set up right after the parade, and so that was a big buzz at the Lentil Fest was oh, yeah. the drones because I think a lot of people haven't seen them before. So. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <coughs> we do have some video footage from the drone and the parade that I'm going to get on. So oh, cool. <laughs> Fancy. I yeah, think Darby purposely took a vacation. Oh, do they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Oh, nothing. <laughs> Don't put that in the minutes. I said Darby purposefully took vacation. I did. And I said decided. I've never been to the Little Festival. I'm apparently on vacation every year during the <laughs> It's going to happen someday. We ended up taking all of the boxes. So, Darby, you labeled a couple of boxes that said Lentil Festival. We went back there, and uh, at Jake thought that all of those boxes were for the Lentil Festival. There's a lot of boxes in that room. <laughs> I can only imagine what you ended up with. So, <laughs> car seats. <laughs> Carrying around all of this stuff. And then, so, at the end of the second, the first day on Friday, uh, I put a bunch of this stuff back in the UTV and I 
made one of the officers drive it back up, but uh, I'm sure you had way too things. much stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we can't carry around all this stuff, so I didn't leave that mess for you to deal with Perfect, on just Saturday. Just rocks. <laughs> yeah, just rocks. So, but yeah. Um, so we may have given away more crayons than you might have intended, because we had that whole box of crayons there. Oh, I think we still have more. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Okay, so why don't we go on to Chief Jenkins for a police department update then? All right. So last time I reported that we were doing a recruitment for a code enforcement officer position, and the top applicant is a record specialist. So. Uh, we're just doing an updated background on her, but uh, we also had another record specialist resign. Um, she had some just some um, personal circumstances change, and she needed just a day shift job, so she got another uh, job somewhere else. So we have one vacancy right now, and I don't want to create a second vacancy by pulling the record specialist to be a code enforcement officer. So we're going to keep her her in records while we work on uh, replacing the vacancy in records. Uh, we do still have a good hiring list, so we're doing chief's interviews for those uh, record specialists now. So once we get one record specialist hired, then we can move uh, the one uh, code enforcement applicant into code enforcement, and then we will fill in behind her. Um, on August 16th, uh, the College Hill officer and I met with the National Panhellenic Council and United Greek Council, which is the Multicultural Greek Presidents. Uh, August 23rd to 29th, I went, uh, I was invited, and I think I talked about this last time, but WSU invited me to go with them on a goodwill trip to American Samoa. So I went with the university president and vice president, uh, Mary Jo Gonzalez, and uh, alumni, um, um, Jack Thompson, and his son, Tony Thompson. And his son, Tony Thompson, works in the Carson College of Business. Um, and so we met with the um, uh, governor, lieutenant governor of American Samoa. We toured their hospital there. Uh, we toured their community college. Um, met with their police commissioner, was out of town, so we met with the assistant police commissioner. Then we flew to what used to be called Western Samoa, which is now independent nation of Samoa. Uh, so American Samoa is a U.S. territory, and then Western Samoa is a, an independent nation. It's a 30-minute flight on this really small plane. Uh, but, and when we land, we get the, it's the same time zone, but a whole different day. So we left on a Saturday and got there on a Sunday, half hour later. Um, and so we were there for a couple of days and we met with the Prime Minister of Samoa and then uh, went and uh, met with the staff at their university there. And so uh, a lot of these meetings, uh, President Kirk Schultz uh, was talking with them about potential for partnerships between the university and, the, and particularly the community college and the universities there as well as the hospital, uh, now that we have our own medical school. Um, and then, um, you know, topics came up as well about uh, some of the things that happened last year and some of the community's concerns about sending students here and wondering whether, you know, um, it's safe for them to be here and whether uh, there's uh, discrimination against them and those types of things. And so I could speak to that and um, let them know that, you know, we're, we're professional here and that uh, we take uh, the responsibility very seriously about them trusting their family to come all the way here to go to school. And so I think we really developed some really good positive relationships with the community there. Um, and I learned a lot about the culture and uh, so I'll, I'm planning to go and attend all of our shift briefings and, and pass that information along to them. I think it'll help our officers communicate better with the students that are here from Samoa. Uh, and I think we're planning also to meet with the Samoan students at, at WSU uh, to talk about our trip and just kind of uh, further enhance that relationship. So I think it was a real, real positive trip. And they, the other part of it too was I think just the fact of us going there, they were very appreciative and I think it's the first time there's been a major university president that's visited there at all. Um, so it was really a big deal for them. 
uh, September 1st, our newest police officer that recently graduated from the police academy took her oath of office at the police department, uh, Riley Harkins. So she's now in our field training program, and you heard about the field training program some, from Sergeant Hopkins North. Uh, September 2nd was our first home game of the season, WSU versus Montana State. Uh, we were really busy, I, you know, everything overall went very well. Usually on home football game weekends, for the weekend, we range between 150 and 200 calls for service. So our guys are really busy, guys and gals. Uh, September 5th and 6th, uh, this is the first year we were invited to uh, present with WSU Police Department at uh, classes that they have specifically for new student athletes that come to WSU. So whether they're a freshman or whether they're a transfer from a junior college, um, they have classes uh, for them to kind of get um, acclimated to Washington State University and kind of let them know what their uh, responsibilities are. And we, we impress upon them how they are, whether they want to be or not, they're role models for people. And so their actions do make a difference. And um, that they have some extra responsibility on them as being a student athlete. And, and it's tough for them because they, they have uh, kind of double duty, not on, it's tough just being a full-time student, but then add on to that their responsibilities as an athlete. So it's, it's a tough road for them. And so we try to develop a real positive relationship with them up front and let them know that there's, you know, we want to try to keep them out of trouble as much as possible. Uh, and if there's anything that we can do to help them do that, we're happy to do that. And they connect with our College Hill officer, Alex Gordon, get his cell phone number, and we let them know if they're ever in a situation where things are going downhill and they need some help uh, de-escalating things, uh, we want to get there and try to do that before uh, things go bad. September 7th was uh, a, an official grand opening of the Spokane Falls Community College presence on WSU campus. They used to be at Gladish and now they moved to WSU. And so a few of us from the city went to that and Glenn, of course, was there and helped with that. And then this last weekend uh, was the second home game, WSU versus Boise State, which was a late night, triple overtime. Were you guys at the game? No. 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 Mm -mm. That's past my bedtime. Yeah, it, yeah, it went, <laughs> it went late. Um, I'd given up on them long before uh, that, but anyway. So again, it was it was a busy weekend, um, and then we have another home game, of course, coming up this next weekend because we have five in a row. Uh, this Saturday, it's at 3 p.m. is the game here with Oregon State. Uh, so coming up tomorrow night uh, is a city council meeting where I'll be bringing to them a proposed taxi ordinance amendment. Uh, currently, our taxi ordinance does not accommodate uh, services like Lyft and Uber. So uh, I did a lot of research about how their backgrounds differ from the backgrounds we currently do. And we took public input at, uh, in fact, uh, I think the Police Advisory Committee hosted one of those uh, the meetings for that. And so it'll be going, uh, all the report was given to council, and, and so they'll be discussing it tomorrow night. And if you, if you happen to have the Lyft app or you've been a Lyft customer, you probably got an email today uh, asking you to send a, go online and fill out this thing that's going to go to the Pullman City Council. <laughs> um, September 19th, I'll be going to Tacoma. Uh, I'm on the... A legislative uh, body-worn camera task force and we have a meeting and um, I'll be presenting with another uh, uh, three of us are presenting from the government end of uh, the, the um, topic and uh, there'll be someone from the Association of Washington Cities will be presenting and a chief from an agency who has chosen not to use body-worn cameras will be explaining why they've chosen not to and it's generally around the public records uh, issue and then I'll be talking about uh, as an, from an agency that has implemented it and some of the challenges that we have because of the public records laws. Uh, September 30th, uh, we ha previously had a uh, disaster exercise plan for the Mos uh, Pullman Moscow Regional Airport. It was planned for earlier in September and it got moved back to September 30th, so now that's the date that we're gonna have that exercise. 
Um, I was contacted by the manager at the McDonald's on South Grand Avenue who wants to start a regular coffee with a cop uh, event. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually, a, I think there's a national um, movement uh, where it's just designed to have some informal meetings between the police and the communities they serve. And so they're trying to get me, uh, the, uh, the chief of WSUPD and the Whitman County Sheriff, uh, to meet uh, and have just be down there for a couple of hours. McDonald's will supply the coffee and we'll be there to talk about whatever they want to talk about. So that's tentatively set for October 4th. Um, I'm available and he was checking with the other two to see if they were. Uh, and I think he's thinking about having that maybe every quarter or something like that. Uh, there was nothing last year reported for constituency, uh, but uh, Richard Hume did send an email before this meeting about the railroad crossing on Grand Avenue by the library. Uh, when you drive over it, uh, there yeah. sounds like there's some loose metal, and I noticed the same thing myself when I drove over it. He so anyway, it sounds like a bomb going on. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a slight exaggeration. Oh, yeah, I would use but it does seem wonky. <laughs> oh, Richard. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I passed that on to Public Works, who then copied me on an email because apparently Washington Department of Transportation handles that, so <clears throat> they've been notified of that. So that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. I'm excited to hear about this uh, coffee with a cup event <laughs> uh, and how that turns out. Hopefully, we uh, can get that Facebook post out so we can all share. Yeah, that. once we get it confirmed, we'll be doing a lot of social media. Okay. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to attend that first one just to go in there and see. That's really cool. So, and it's nice to hear that your trip went well. It sounds like it was very productive. It was. It was a great trip. Any questions from anyone? No? We had to wear, when we went and met with. I saw pictures. Did you? Where did you see pictures? <laughs> uh, Twitter, I think. From who? Uh, All sorts of I think it maybe was the Kirk Schultz, maybe? Yeah, I think it was Schultz's account. So they have what's called the lava lava, and it's like a, just looks like a long dress. It goes down to like just above your ankles, and that's what guys wear. I mean, yeah. we were. We were in the minority when we were out wearing shorts or whatever. And uh, so when we met with officials, that's what we wore. So we wore those and sandals. I wore sandals the whole week. It was awesome. <laughs> I'm thinking about changing our, I know. It was great. I don't know if I'd wear the lava lava all the time. But it's probably more comfortable. It is. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. I wear dresses all the time in the summer. <laughs> So we're going to have a pretty short poll today, but I guess we can start with Amy. Um, I have nothing from Military Hill, but I will say um, from, because I'm also a graduate student at WSU, um, and I've heard a lot of talk of appreciation for the police department's post regarding undocumented students. That was last weekend or within the last week. Um, so just wanted to pass along those appreciative messages. Great. Yeah, and, and to let you know, too, um, we recently, well, for a couple of months, I'd been working with the Seattle office of the ACLU on putting together uh, an immigration policy because we needed to update ours just because of everything that's going on and ours was outdated. And so we finally came to a, a, an agreement on that, our final policy that they were happy with and we were happy with. And uh, so Darby had been, you know, watching things on social media and so she, she suggested we put something out on it and so she she wrote it up and did a really good job with it excellent work all right as for Pullman at large today um, I worked with the student veterans committee and for the first time in a while wazoo put on well not exactly not exactly put on but we had a 9-11 memorial out on the Glen Terrell mall all day today and then I know that the Air Force ROTC put on an honor guard at 10 a.m. so wow. as for in the community that's at least what I've seen for 9-11 coverage but nice. that's all I've got Good. Um, I think really from the, from the business side of things, um, first I've heard about some of the home intrusions <laughs> on Sunnyside Hill. Yeah, so there's been some postings on next door. Have yeah. you seen those? Yeah, I think that's where it came from. Actually. Yeah. So Darby uh, went ahead and posted today. I don't know if you saw her oh, post, but she uh, she did that. post some information <clears throat> about. Um, some of the crime that's been occurring on uh, Sunnyside Hill. And we have had some 
I actually think I am. I guess maybe you can see. We had some um, incidents where, like, I think it was very late at night or early morning hours, people would ring the doorbell, and then if nobody answered, then they would try to burglarize their house. Um, so we've had a few people that have had their doorbell rung. You know, I hate that. Huh? I hate that. <laughs> nope. Yeah, I don't have that with me. And then we've, we also had, previously we had some car prowls on, on Sunnyside. Not as many as we were having on other hills, uh, but we did have some. Uh, we do have uh, one person that, uh, I don't think we've arrested the person. Did we arrest So they were forwarding charges. Charges. On. We had identified one person in, in at least one car prowl. We suspect they were responsible for more, but probably not all of them. And then we had some, have some evidence with some, uh, their fingerprints or DNA that we were processing as well. Uh, but we, and we had a, a few people that we were suspected, but we just don't have enough evidence. And a lot of times on those car prowls, uh, you know, if we find somebody that does one, we can maybe charge them with one, but they're likely responsible for much more than that. What are the charges for that? Like the penalty? Mm -hmm. um, you know what? I'm not. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I think it's a. Um, well, it's either a, a gross misdemeanor, which could be like a year in in jail. Uh, I think it's a lot right around that mm -hmm. type of a sentence. Now Steve's going to be paranoid about locking the, the doors. <laughs> he already is. Pretty. Well, good, because that's what we want people to do is to lock the doors. I mean, not that I'm not paranoid about locking the doors. <laughs> that's, that's what we've been doing. I mean, it's like we always lock them at night, but during the day, you know, I don't know. We had, like, someone who, like, someone just walked in. I thought I heard when they were actually there, or they saw from something on their house when they were actually there. And it's mm -hmm. like, normally if I'm there, I think, well, I'm here, and I was gonna, you know. <laughs> well, and so, I mean, if, if you are, like, home at, at night, and you oh. hear your doorbell ring, yeah. so you need to be thinking that there could be somebody that's gonna, if, if nobody answers, then they may try to break into your house. Yeah, because I'm probably not going to answer someone that rings my doorbell at 3 in the morning. Right. So, I mean, that's totally worth a call to the police department because we will come out. Good to know. Somebody ringing a doorbell at 3 in the morning, and we'll come out and check that out for sure. <laughs> Good to know. So, and if during the day if someone suspiciously rings the doorbell and then just runs off? Yeah, I would still call. I think okay. that's suspicious okay. enough. Okay. Because uh, there's plenty of those crimes that occur during the daytime as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good to know. Yeah. I have no updates. Uh, I was going to ask about the same thing, and so that that was it. Um, so other than that, do we have any public comment? <laughs> <laughs> I would look at the YouTube watchers, but they could just leave a comment below, and then Darby will get back to us on those comments. <laughs> so, all right, our next meeting is October 9th, and uh, we are going to be hopefully setting up something with the Greek Council. Right. I, I contacted the assistant director of the, I forget the, his title, the name of the, it. It's switched a few times, the title. For the, <laughs> so, but it's over the Greek system. The director somehow. of the Greek. Uh, and I haven't heard back from them yet, but that's what we're working on. Perfect. Yeah. And I can contact them again, too. So um, we'll hopefully have that all set up for October 9th meeting. And then uh, the... Have we heard again from Charlene and how she's feeling? Any updates? Okay. I have not heard. Okay. So, well, hopefully Charlene will be feeling better soon as November <laughs> comes around. So, see you guys all in October. <laughs> Usually we have a motion to adjourn, so. Oh, we don't need to. Okay. <laughs> I guess we don't need to. Yeah, because we didn't even meet quorum. So. <laughs> we but can actually adjourn our meeting. <laughs> yeah. We don't have enough. You know, before we leave, Alexis, was there, you had uh, emailed, I think, Darby. Yeah. So Unfortunately, this is my last meeting. Oh, this no. Senior year is a 
bit more than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> I thought it was going to be the easier year, downhill slide, and then all of a sudden I decided to get involved in everything. So <laughs> unfortunately, I'm going to have to say goodbye. But I do want to thank you guys because it's been really fun to be here. And like I was telling Darby earlier, I've never seen a police advisory committee before. Like I thought I was maybe oblivious to them my whole time, but it doesn't sound like they're as common. So this is super fun to be a part of. No, Thanks for the time that you've you know, committed to us and, and your input, and we've oh. really appreciated you. Thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't be here longer. <laughs> no, that is okay. Thank you so much for being here. You've given us a lot of valuable input, the way you participated, and so it's been great to have you on the committee. Oh, so. thank you. It's been great to be here. Yeah. Thank you. It's too bad. I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, well thank you so much, and we'll vote on the minutes at the next meeting and take care of that then.